Two lovers drive out into the Arizona desert, expecting nothing but beauty and relaxation. What they find instead is incomprehensible. Welcome to Forgotten Tales, where we go through old stories that are at risk of being forgotten into the deepest recesses of the subconscious mind. Tonight we'll be taking a look at a very classic creepypasta called Arizona. First, we'll read through the classic urban legend, and then we'll hang out, reflect on it, and I'll give you some of my thoughts. So without further ado, relax, get comfortable, and enjoy tonight's story. The classic, Arizona. For her birthday, I took my girl Katie to Arizona so we could stay with some friends of hers and spend a few weeks partying and getting crazy and stuff before heading back to school for the year. We drove up in my dad's car. It's a really old Ford make and it's pretty beat up. The road there was bumpy and long. Our relationship seemed at its strongest on the road. We were really in love. That was the first time I realized that. I had never truly been in love before. We were about halfway there when we realized we were going to run out of gas long before the nearest petrol pump. Katie's head was out of the window, sunglasses on in the blistering heat outside, nothing but the wild desert landscape to be seen in all directions. We became frantic. We hadn't seen another car on the road in almost an hour. What if we broke down here, in the middle of the desert with no food or water? with no one out there to find us. I sped up slightly, driven by these fears. It was then that we came across a gas station, smack bang in the middle of nowhere, in dry, empty nowhere. It was an old, worn-down servo. The long, yellow grass blew in the breeze beneath it. Outside were two rusted gas pumps, at first we didn't know if it was occupied, it seemed so lifeless, but as we pulled up and saw the petrol stains and the dirt, we were convinced otherwise. Katie started refilling the car, and I went inside to pay, and grab something to eat on the road. When I first went to open the door, it jammed. This perturbed me, so I looked up at the sign to check and was reassured that the store was open, according to the torn sign that hung in between the dull yellow curtains at the door window. I pushed harder and harder, and with effort, got into the shop. Inside, it was totally abandoned and left to ruin. Complete aisles lay on the ground, the fridges were smashed and glass coated on the floor. Despite the brightness outside, the interior of the gas station was dark and bitterly cold. Then there came, from behind me, this quiet weeping, like a child's. I felt my heart race. It was coming from the back room. I stepped over the smashed glass and twisted metal remnants on the floor over where the patches of grass had grown through. I ran my hand along the wall and felt the crisscross of ivy beneath my fingers. It was overgrown. There came the crying again, and now I was facing the back room door. It was directly in front of me. I pushed the door open and it creaked with rust in its joints. Inside, there lay several wooden steps into the basement. It was pitch black, and the smell was horrific. The drip drop of water alerted me to the fact the basement was flooded. 
the water was up to my knees. Again, there came the crying, in a small splash in the far corner of the basement. Hello? I called out. Is anyone there? I started approaching the corner. The smell was horrible, and cold water eventually got to me. The sobbing was getting louder. In the corner, I swore I saw something move against the shadows. Hello? I called again. What's wrong? I finally reached the corner. Still dark, I had to bend down to avoid the pipes, which leaked down my back and trickled down my spine. The figure in front of me was very small and black, hunched over, sobbing quietly, head in its hands. Why are you down here? I whispered. Then, it stopped moving completely. It was totally still. All noise seemed to cease, but for the quiet dripping of a broken pipe somewhere behind me. I outstretched my arm to touch its tiny shoulder, but it then began to slowly turn in my direction to look me eye to eye. As its face swiveled around to look into mine, I remember screaming and swinging my head up in recoil, cracking it on the pipes up above. The face was white as a sheet, pale like a hideous moving mask. The eyes and mouth were completely black holes, huge and widening, even as I looked at them. They were so huge, they almost consumed its entire face. As I desperately tried to escape, it splashed towards me at rapid speed, uncurling its long, thin fingers. It was wailing now, staring into me with its huge black eyes, and as I scrambled up the stairs with great difficulty, I felt my legs begin to give way beneath me. It sprinted out of the water and up the stairs towards me. I slammed the door, flipped the lock, and tore out of the store into the old Ford. Katie began to laugh when she saw me, jeans wet, trembling with sweat soaking my chest, but I grabbed her and screamed at her to drive. For about a half an hour, I could barely tell her what happened in the store. She listened and gave me a look of sheer horror when I finally gave in and told her everything. She pulled the car to the side of the road and began to cry herself. I asked her what was wrong. She said, I saw something while you were gone. When you were in the store, I was just putting the pump back. When I saw this little girl, and a man, her father I guess, the father stared at me with blank eyes and a hanging jaw. But the girl, oh god, the girl, she was staring straight at me, grinning with this huge smile that just stretched so far across her face, I couldn't see any hair on her and her skin was so dark. Not dark like a colored girl, but dark like a shadow. And her smile just shone through the window. I convinced myself it was a trick of the eye and looked away. When I looked back, they were gone. Then a little while later, you came back out. It was dusk by now. We had nowhere to stay. We had not traveled nearly as much as we hoped to that day, and the 
nearest motel meant going back past the gas station. So we just drove up from the roadside where we were into the clearing a little way up, where people camped sometimes. We had previously come the night after a big party. There was broken glass everywhere. When we arrived, however, it was empty. After a while, I tried to reassure her that we were okay. I calmed her down and put my arms around her and we started to kiss. I moved to get closer to her when she suddenly screamed like hell itself. It's her! It's her! She screeched, fumbling to start up the engine. I turned in time to witness a small black face, grinning literally ear to ear with only darkness inside. It was crawling into the car through my open window, with its limbs splayed out like an insect. It had too many limbs, way too many long arms, the fingers feeling my face like antenna. We sped off, back down onto the road. Back on the road, nothing seemed right. There were no stars. That was what I noticed first. I was too shaken to think much of it, but there were no clouds that could be blotting them out. There was just the vast night sky, devoid of all light. Then, a few minutes after we had been driving forward, still sweating and breathing heavy, we passed the gas station. My heart skipped a beat. The gas station was at least a half an hour away in the opposite direction. All the lights were on, and I saw the door sliding open. As we shot past it, Katie was in such hysterics, she found it hard to keep driving. We stopped the car in the middle of the desolate road. I decided we should switch seats so that I could drive. She shuffled across from her seat to mine, and I opened the door to get out. As soon as I was outside, the foul stench of the basement overwhelmed me. I gagged, then vomited down the side of the car. It was then I noticed the runner, a pale white thing, sprinting towards us through the fog, its limbs practically a blur. I could make out no face. How long had it been following us? running after us in the night. I got into the driver's seat as quickly as possible. We drove off again, not talking. Katie whimpered and I silently prayed. Then we passed the gas station again. The door was open now. There were two figures standing at the door, waiting. As we forced ourselves on, we both became aware of a soft, barely audible weeping in the back seats. Neither of us dared turn around. Ignore it, I whispered. My trembling hands gripped the steering wheel. Katie was curled in the fetal position, holding her head in her hands. The wailing increased, becoming extremely loud, ear-piercing and horrific. Finally, I ordered myself to end it and looked behind me. For a split second, I thought it was a girl in a white dress looking back up at me but she was gone as soon as she had appeared. I checked the seats carefully. There was nothing. 
In my tiredness and fear, I had completely lost track of the road. I drove on, and all through the night, Katie whimpered. I touched her once, but she screamed. I never tried again after that. The noises from the back seat started up again. We passed the gas station twice more. The people at the door were closer and clearer every time. The finest slither of red light had begun to settle on the horizon. It was still dark as hell, but at least I was able to see the road ahead of me now. Katie had been silent, face concealed under her hands for some time. I decided to check the time, so I turned on the radio. At first, there was only static. Instead of time or anything at all, the digital clock simply appeared black. I fiddled with the dial, trying to change the station. In between the static, I found only one audible channel. It had a high-pitched buzz in the background. A man was muttering names and numbers under his breath. 29. Lucy. 30. Adam. 31. Katie. I switched back to static. I knew which name was next. When we got to Katie's friend's house, it was morning. It was overcast, and everywhere had the smell of rain on it. Her friends weren't home. Katie's friends lived way out in the country with no one else around in a mile. The grass was climbing the walls outside. How long have they been out? As soon as we were inside, Katie started whimpering again. I realized that while she had been silent, she was biting on her lip. Blood was trickling down her chin, and the skin around her mouth was torn and chewed through. She grabbed the newspaper and some masking tape off the table and began blocking out the windows. After the night's events, I didn't know whether I would be insane to join her or stop her. I simply watched. She covered the windows, jammed the door, and turned the lights off. For some time, it could have been minutes or hours, we sat silent in the dark. I offered to turn the television on. Katie said nothing, sitting blank and comatose. I turned the television on anyway. A grainy black and white image flickered to life before us. A white face with empty eyes and an impossibly huge smile flashed up, the smile growing wider and wider the longer we stared into it. There came the sound of weeping. From the television or in the house, I couldn't tell. We turned off the TV. It's been three whole days now. I haven't seen Katie at all today. She spends her time in the closet crying. I once tore the door open and screamed at her. She screamed back, her face contorting into something grotesque and inhuman. I slammed it in her face. The phone rings often. A voice, my mother's, I believe, whispering under its breath. I can only catch snippets of what it says. 
come back. You're always welcome to come back. Sometimes in the background I hear quiet chuckling. I hang up without saying a thing, usually. The bathroom is shining white. I hear the shower running, and will walk in to find nothing. Nothing at all. Then, when I'm in the bathroom, I will hear the television flick back on. It always goes to the face. In the background, there are muttering voices now. I've called the police. Twice. All I get is the whispering woman's voice. I called Katie's friends too. Just as fruitlessly. There are knocks at the door, a lot now. Through the newspaper, on the other side of the window... I see their hands slam against the glass and slide down. They do this for hours on end, sometimes. They press their eyes up to the glass, through the holes in the newspaper. At night, we hear screaming from the guest room. I boarded it up. Sometimes I find tiny pieces of glass on the ground. A leak sprang up about a day ago in my room downstairs. Black spots of mold have appeared on the walls. There is a smell throughout the house, seeping in from my room. The odor of decay. I pray. I pray hopelessly, and I wish, I swear to God, I wish that I had never gotten out of that car. Wow. That was, uh, that was quite a classic, wasn't it? Again, that was the story Arizona. That's been uh, spread around the internet for well over a decade now, I believe. Huge thanks to Dream25 for recommending the story. And Samantha Baker for backing him up. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Reading through that, I was sure that I, I had read it in the past. Because it's such a classic story, and I've uh, heard people talk about it so many times. But reading through it, I'm actually unsure that I ever read it in the past. I think this might have been my first read-through of it. A very impressive story. Yeah, I don't know how many of you listening have uh, been in the desert before, but, uh, you know, especially when you're on, like, a, a highway out in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in the you know, Southwest, it's, uh, it can be quite eerie. You, you do have this intense feeling of this is all very beautiful, but, uh, if anything happened, I'm, I'm as good as dead because there, there really are some of the largest stretches of, uh, just deserted land out there in the desert. It's something that for people who've grown up in the Midwest, and especially people who grew up in the East, in the East Coast. It's probably hard for them to even imagine, actually, the vast uh, stretches and patches of, I mean, essentially wilderness with a, with a big paved road in the middle of it. I'm unsure if um, the story is tapping into any particular ancient urban legends, like with the uh, two creatures that are described, but... Uh, I guess that doesn't matter because it was it was really well done and really well described. This is definitely one of those stories that uh, does not have anything resembling an explanation, which is uh, fine. I think some of the best stories are like that. If I had to guess, I would imagine that 
they ended up on some road that, uh, little did they know, was a road to another dimension of some kind. <laughs> Which uh, sounds a little funny to word it that way, but that seems to be what happened. I mean, once they came across that uh, gas station, things were never anything resembling normal. They never saw another genuine human after that, even when they arrived at their friend's place. I imagine perhaps their friends are actually home, waiting, wondering, hey, when is, you know, our, our girlfriend and, and her boyfriend going to show up? The problem being, uh, they did show up just on another timeline and another dimension. The other option, of course, since uh, a recurring theme in the story is decay, you know, the smell of decay, mold growing on the walls, uh, just kind of disgusting environments that are falling apart. It's also possible that, you know, they were, they got in some car wreck shortly into the adventure they were going on. And all of this took place in some hellish underworld dream nightmare dimension. That wouldn't be surprising to me if, if that was part of the idea either. You know, with that phone call in, uh, in which the main character uh, picks up the phone and it's, uh, it's his mother's voice saying, come back, you're always welcome to come back. It would be useful to know whether his mother is alive or if uh, his mother is dead because if his mother's alive, then we can, uh, we can assume that this is some kind of creepy creeper. You know what I mean? This is some kind of demonic force that's uh, trying to deceive and trick this guy. If it's, if his mother's dead, it could still be that, or it could be pointing to the possibility that, um, you know, the boyfriend and girlfriend died on the road and they transferred, in, you know, their consciousnesses into this new plane of existence. But that because they're so frightened and they don't know they've died, they kind of haven't found their way on to being able to move on, to use kind of a cliche uh, terminology. But in which case, it could be, you know, that could be his actual mother trying to come through, trying to uh, coax him to, uh, you know, come back. You know, you're always welcome to come back. As in, come back to the place you were before you were born, where she is now. I don't know, there's, there's, there's definitely some philosophical underpinnings that you could you could explore in this story and i you know now that i'm thinking about i'm kind of thinking about the story uh in reverse here uh but going back to the beginning at that first gas station um you know he sees that uh creature in the basement and it turns out at the same time or perhaps shortly before his girlfriend saw what looked like a, a father and his daughter although quite disturbing looking situation there what if they also are are you know a, a father and daughter who died on that road or in that desert somewhere and now they uh, they haunt the place or perhaps uh, an egregore or thought form of their pain has been left behind in that area in that plane of existence where the main character and his girlfriend now reside i don't know just some thoughts uh, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think of this story? It's, it's a pretty interesting one. Now, time for the rating. I, I'd probably rate this story... I feel like I've been giving every story like three out of five bones. Perhaps... Mm, I'm feeling a three out of five again. I, I, I don't want to give it a three out of five, simply because that's what I've given the last two uh, old stories I've covered. But, um... Yeah, I feel like I feel like um, it got a little too strange at the end for me. Like uh, I feel like maybe the last little chunk once they got to the house should have been maybe expanded upon a little more because it almost seems like a series of of weird events. And you know, I, I just going back to the meaning of the story again with that weird radio station they turned to that could also imply some kind of like black ops weird cia military government creepiness you know <laughs> but yeah going back to the rating 
I, uh, yeah, probably three out of five. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm, I guess, I guess I'm boring so far. I bet the next one won't be a three out of five, but I'm feeling three out of five. So let me know what you thought of this story in the comments below. Let me know what you thought of this episode of Forgotten Tales. I got a comment on the last episode where I covered the Russian sleep experiment saying, uh, what do you mean this is a forgotten tale? This is like a really popular story. And yeah, I mean, Russian sleep experiment is uh, one of the most popular classic creepypastas. The title Forgotten Tales isn't meant to literally mean, you know, I'm, I'm only going to look at stories that literally everyone has forgotten and there's no trace of anywhere. Uh, it's, it's to imply that these are quite aged and people don't tend to seek out uh, these older ones, I've noticed. Like they do... Uh, new ones, new stories, which makes sense. Everybody's always looking for the new thing. But uh, yeah, this is this is just a podcast uh, to look at the uh, classic era of creepy pastas and urban legends. So no need to take the title so literally. All right. Uh, thank you all for watching, listening, telling a friend if you'd like. I didn't really want to post another Forgotten Tales um, before I, I got out another original story. But um, the original story I'm working on is taking a little bit of time, so I, I thought it could be a good idea to just get this out for, for viewers who uh, do enjoy the old tales and hearing my thoughts on them. And I guess it could uh, maybe hold them over a little bit if uh, they're, they're having the itch. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story. And I will see you all later. Have a good night. Cheers. <laughs>